Well, I, you know, I, I do know there are good legends, and there are other kinds of legends, and uh, once someone very wise said, if you really want to become a legend, don't work on the good side, work on the bad side, because it's a much more effective and direct and quick way to get there. So I'm not sure which kind of legend that was, uh, but thank you. Now, when Eliza called, I got to admit, my first reaction was I don't belong in this group. Uh, my practice, I believe, I know, does not focus as a central focus on rainwater, but I did reflect on it a little bit more, and it certainly is an idea that has woven its way through a course of a career that's stretched out now. So I thought it might be interesting to look at four different projects that stretch over four and actually touch into five decades, a kind of startling uh, long time. Uh, they're very different projects, uh, and they were done in very different times, but they do have some consistencies, and certainly one of them is an environmental underpinning to the thinking. But more than that, it's an intense interest in uh, making places and in the way delineating a line of rainwater can not only organize a place, but really uh, determine its essential spirit. Uh, so, uh, they're very different projects, but they do have some progression uh, over time uh, that are uh, identifiable. Uh, they change as we move chronologically from small to large, from private to public, from simple to complex, and from uh, a great deal of engagement on my, my part to less engagement on my part. And I'll come back and talk about those ideas a little bit more as I go through the projects. But the first project, uh, Hawkness Residence, was a project we started in 1978, uh, and a very simple plan for a project, uh, a blue runnel that runs along the side of the house, collects rainwater, that seams together a bluestone terrace and a cedar deck. Um, it is a project in which I had very deep engagement, I not only designed it and drew it, but helped build it, and in the end, sculpted a hawk and family name H-A-U-K, uh, but a little bit of a play on words, that serves as a kind of crest for the family and a centerpiece uh, for the design. I sculpted that hawk because of a kind of accident in that the progress of the project got interrupted by an invitation I had to go to Rome for a year at the American Academy. And at the Academy was a sculptor in residence who carved woods carved wood, and he gave me enough advice to make me dangerous, and I decided I'd go out and sculpt this hawk while I was in Rome. So I started drawing hawks, getting a feeling for their shape, their face, the images and character of it, and I started thinking about how I could laminate up some blocks of mahogany from the local lumber yard. I went out and got some beautiful German gouges, uh, and I'd worked as a finishing carpenter for a number of years in an earlier career, so I, I, you know, I was not uncomfortable with wood, and started drawing this idea of sculpting this thing, this a full-scale drawing, not as you're seeing it, but as it was drawn, and this thing is a, a, about three feet long, nine, uh, 11 inches high and about nine inches wide, and you can't see it in this photograph, but there's a line that delineates the core which touches the mouth and conveys the water that then comes out of the corner of that thing. And I sculpted this thing uh, in Italy. Uh, it, it turned out to be kind of an angry bird. I didn't really intend that, but an angry bird. And when I wrapped it in bubble wrap and put a handle on it, uh, it, it was an ominous bird. And it still astounds me that I walked through the airport onto the plane with this heavy, ominous thing in my hand. But it's simply a testament that this was done when the world was very, very different a long time ago. I did get it back to the US and I spliced it on to the end of a 60-foot long baby blue redwood runnel that ran along the side. Whoops, excuse me. I knew I was going to get the... I, I'm not ambidextrous enough to handle two things at one time. Uh, it runs along uh, the edge of a house, sometimes filled with gravel, sometimes with a wood cover. Wood cover uh, that is gouged with that same German gouge so that you can step over it. It collects all the, 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 down, the leaders from the roof and it transports this water out to the end through the hawk into this dark, 
not quite that dark in reality, aquatic pool, which then lets it out into a woodland stream and the stream valley beyond. A very simple project, an easy project uh, to build. It required no, no, whoops, trying to back up there, required no engineering. Uh, there was really very little discussion about rainwater at this time in 1978. Uh, and, and absolutely no interest in the agency level, so no approval processes, because nobody really cared what you were doing about water at this scale at this time. Uh, it was followed about 10 years later by the second project, and this is a, for the Turkowitz family. The project gets a little bigger. It is, in this small diagram, a two-acre property at the base of a 17-acre watershed. And the owners came to us interested in the siting for a new garage and playhouse, and the idea of upsizing a pipe that ran through a gravel turnaround and flooded periodically. We sited the new garage just offside the cor corner of the house. It made a threshold to a new woodland garden and instead of upsizing the pipe, we tapped a certain amount of water, carried it through to water and enrich that garden. And we did it with very, very simple, non-technical mechanical uh, apparatus. You're looking at a plan of that that you just saw here, and then pulled out from it is kind of a perspective uh, schematic with the house and the garage there and there. And uh, we designed this thing around three flows. The base flow with this tributary, uh, seven gallons per minute is about the volume that comes out of a full turned on garden hose. So not a lot of water. Uh, up to a small storm, that amount of water we carried overland. That small storm bypassed uh, that overland flow and went back into the pipe, which we left in the ground and carried the water through there. And then in a larger storm, actually, uh, the pipe backs up, the water overflows and drops down through a series of vegetated swales that were designed to accommodate uh, that level of flow. There are three pieces that accomplished that. Uh, a log dam in the stream that allowed us to lift the stream water up enough to get it over the top and into a series of step pools, which then transitioned through another, another splitter into a different type of line, a more highly delineated line. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about each one of those pieces of the project, starting with this log dam. And it goes to a section. This is a concrete headwall for the pipe which we left, left in place. About six feet upstream of that, we built this log dam which allowed us to raise the water level, because the water level before was just right down here, raise that water level up enough that we could carry it in a little notched log flume across bridging that and over the top of the headwall and into a series of step gardens. So that little notch right there is calibrated to carry seven, or maximum 15 gallons per minute. And if we look at a sketch of that pre-construction, there's that log dam that has raised the water level of the stream, and then the log flume that carries it across the existing headwall. That's that log dam under construction. It also serves as a bridge. If we stand on that bridge and look later, there's the the notched flume that carries the water out into the series of step pools from above the headwall, the dam, the log flume, and then you begin to see what is a series of step walls that drop down through this little wooden, woodland garden. All of these components were made out of trees that were taken down to make room for the garage. Uh, same German gouge that I used to carve the uh, hawk. Uh, I did here just to notch in a beaver-like quality uh, the gaps where the small flows, but I've always loved the work of beaver in the landscape and that mimicking that in a way. That series of step pools drops down through what was a gravel turnaround and now uh, a woodland ephemeral garden that transitions through another splitter in that gap in that threshold between the garage and the house 
to an architectural line, stone-lined runnel, that runs through a new arrival court out beyond here by an aquatic pool before it delivers the water back out to a tributary that it serves. And that all is good and fine and happy, but there is a backstory to it that's probably more interesting. And that is that the project got finished the first week of December, and it looks something like this raw. There's the log flume, a series of kind of dancing uh, step pools. First week of December. The second week of December, we had an extraordinary ice storm that covered this 17 acres in almost an inch of ice, turned it into 17 acres of parking lot, and it was followed by a deluge thunderstorm, very unusual change in weather. And everything that we had just got, th that had just been put in, and big logs from upstream in this watershed, all carried down through that gap between garage uh, and house and deposited in one big pile in the front yard of this house. We were lucky we, we, we had an understanding owner, understood that all the calculations we did, which were the basis of the design, were blown out of the water by this extraordinary event. It also, you know, reminded me of what's been said, the ephemeral, not only the ephemeral and unpredictable nature of water, but the ephemeral uh, nature of landscape that depends on water in all respects. Uh, we did rebuild it, it did grow in, and, and it is a happy place, and it is environmentally sound, but more than that, it did really change the spirit of this place, and it allows the owners to experience both the sound and the sight of natural flowing water as part of their daily routines. But the best thing about it, I think, is that it used these very simple, almost ancient, but, but innovative, because we kind of made them up as we went, techniques of managing water, but without real mechanics as such, just physical things. So about a decade later, third project, very different type of project and different client, uh, a, a corporate headquarters for Gannett USA Today. It sits on, I'll get back to that, sits on a, a 25 acre site at the base of a 250 acre watershed. So stepping into a semi public realm uh, at a larger scale. Uh, very complicated regulatory overlay on now we're looking at the 25 acre site on a five acre out parcel that was a stormwater management facility for the whole region. Very complicated overlay on that piece of the project. But we set a very simple otherwise reading of the landscape where trees cover the beautiful hilltop, water fills the lowland here, and then meadow occupies a flatland which was a former fill site for adjacent construction. When we got involved in the project, the consensus was to put the complex on that wooded hilltop for a simple idea of site repair. That is, the idea that you invest your money and effort in the parts of the site that need to be repaired and you leave those parts of the site that are healthy in their existing state. We convinced the owner to reverse that, put the complex down on the meadow and improve that in the process, preserve the hill site, the hill top in its wooded state. And then we made a promise to improve that regional stormwater pond, which was uh, to, unsightly to say the least. And that's what scared me about this project the most. Were we really able, with the regulatory overlay on that, to improve it and draw it into the project and really turn it into an amenity? We went about it by making a kind of common shaped by the building, articulated by a series of walls that terrace the topography, control drainage, tie the landscape to the building, and tie both to the stormwater pond that's just out of sight. We found inspiration for that in terms of patterns and the way logs float in the water, but more specifically and more directly, the same but in expanded nature now that we did at Turkowitz, where they're dancing down the hillside. But in this case, we rendered that thing, we rendered those logs in stone, but in terms of performance and function, we patterned them after the native P Piedmont woodland, where fallen logs, terrace topography and control drainage in an appropriate and effective way. And when we designed this thing, we never quite let those log, sto stone logs touch, so the water slips between the gaps in those 
stone walls and through a series of vegetated step pools on their way down to what is an improved stormwater management pond. The last log we put in ran right through here and it created a lifted four bay functioning in all the ways that uh, Warren talked about at the Dell, but also as a kind of culmination of a series of step pools and their rhythm down and out to that larger pond. If we step out into the pond or at the edge of the, the, the four bay uh, with its improved riparian plantings, out farther and look back at the project, uh, you can see how water and walls and landscape and building all merge into one coherent composition. Uh, but there's a backstory here too, in, in that as good as this looked and felt, we ended the process, and Doug Hayes, I should have said at the outset here, uh, from my office was an instrumental part of this project and in particular of getting the stormwater pond to work through the regulatory overlays associated with it both very frustrated because we had really imagined this project to be a model of environmental uh, sustainability, environmental uh, responsibility. There are about two acres of roof gardens associated uh, with uh, the project. We tried, and this is 1996, we tried to convince the owner to go to extensive root systems, thin soil. There wasn't a single installation that we could take them to successful in the U.S., lots in Germany at that time, but not a single in the U.S. that we could convince them to go in this direction. So we ended up with thick soil systems. We wanted desperately to have a cistern at the base of, or the high point of the beginning of that runnel so that we could collect roof water and let it feed that system. But that was an unusual position within the permitting agency. It was going to increase the length of obtaining permits, so we had to pump water up from uh, the pond to the head of the runnels to feed that series. Uh, so we ended up being quite frustrated that this wasn't what it should be. Three years later, we opened this uh, roll call. It's a newspaper for uh, addressed to congressmen on Capitol Hill. ASLA had taken out a full-page ad using this project as an example of all those things that we said it wasn't. Uh, it's not to say ASLA was right. They weren't. It should have been better. But it is to say that, uh, you know, all of our projects, they're never quite as good as we'd like them to be. Always work at making them better. But at a certain point, relax and enjoy the successes you have. And I've gotten better through the progress of my career of allowing myself to do that. So from there, I go to the fourth project. And it's a current effort. It's the iQuilt plan in Hartford, Connecticut. It's a revitalization plan for downtown Hartford. Uh, it's comprehensive in that it deals with both large-scale ideas and small-scale ideas at the same time. At the small-scale level, it does things that address comfort and the encouragement. And these are a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but a eye quilt quilt. Uh, that allow people and encourage people to come out and use the outdoors even within Hartford's less than ideal climate. At the big scale, it does things like anticipate the renovation of Bushnell Park, which is a 57-acre jewel in the middle of downtown, uh, the first publicly funded park in the U.S. Uh, uh, Water running through that park was an instrumental part of the vision as it was designed by Wiedemann in the 1860s, and you see his plan there, and as it was, in, as it was envisioned by Horace Bushnell, after which it's named, uh, great, the originator of the park and a great visionary and a mentor of Frederick Law Olmsted Sr., who grew up here, uh, a, a mentor of his. Two disastrous floods in the 30s led to the piping of that river under uh, the park. It's a pipe with a lot of pedigree because the Olmsted brothers did it. Uh, but an instrumental part of the idea of the renovation of this park is bringing that water back up to the surface. In principle, it's no different than Turkowitz. We're borrowing a certain amount of water, a controlled amount of water, out of that pipe, running it over land, returning it to that pipe, but leaving that pipe in place to control flooding and continue to protect the um, the, the park. Uh, it is, in essence, a renovation project, but it also is most definitely a design problem. How that line might delineate itself, how the character of the stream as it courses through uh, the park uh, might change. I won't go into much detail on that, but I'll give you a little bit of a taste of the different sections. The upper reach is very much part of the city. 
it nests in both plan and elevation to the street as it drops very gently down through the middle reach. The middle reach pulls away from the street and the city and lowers down. It becomes a highly environmental section. Uh, its edges get soft. Uh, its plantings highly textured and intricate, seasonally variable. And it picks up something, the, text, uh, the, the picturesque component of the composition of the park, which was a part of Wiedemann's original design. And as the park moves to the lower reach, uh, the, the stream actually gets low enough so that bridges coplanar with the street above can pass over it and paths that me meander along its edge and it's able to recapture some of the original physical quality of the park and the kind of social interaction that it fostered. So the city is uh, at a kind of critical point uh, and considering what a lot of cities are considering, daylighting uh, a major stream. But it's a big decision with a big price tag, but it's at a particularly interesting moment in their time. The city lived with a park with running natural water for 70, its first 70 years of its life. Uh, it then lived with a park with no running water for a number, uh, another 70 years. So the question of whether what its next 70 years will be like is a big one uh, for the city. Uh, a great deal of public enthusiasm uh, for uh, uh, the idea of daylighting the water, uh, but a big price tag. The piece of optimism I have about it is that the agency that controls the treatment of water or that controls the water in Hartford that I thought would be the most difficult hurdle to get over was the first to embrace it. So we'll see where it goes, but I'm optimistic. So if I return and finish with where we started, what is there to kind of gather between this, and how much overtime am I? Uh, but that's not, I meant not eight minutes, I'm two minutes over time. Nah, okay. So I will finish this. Um, so what, what, you know, what lessons or what might uh, look at uh, in summary? And I think there are four thoughts. A couple of them are personal to me and a couple of them maybe of more general interest. The first is that uh, I learned that I draw better than I sculpt. I learned that way back then. I don't regret that I did that, but I haven't tried it again and I probably won't. Uh, the second is... Um, that I lost a second. This is a famous moment, isn't it? Um, no, I'm not going to give up on that one. Well, uh, I, I may, may only give you three. Uh, the, the, the size of these projects and the complexity, all of the things that I talked about that have changed over time are not surprising for an individual career. Increase in size, increase in public realm, uh, increase in complexity of the projects, uh, all not surprising for an individual. But I think the interesting thing is the degree to which that reflects the progress of the profession over these decades to the fact that today the profession is doing bigger projects, more public projects, uh, more complicated projects with a stronger scientific basis and bigger interdisciplinary teams, uh, you know, is a beautiful and a wonderful thing. And, and this progress in its microcosm, I think, reflects that idea. So I do skip the middle one, if it comes back to me in the questions, I'll remember. But the last is more personal, and it's this idea of engagement. And it disturbed me a little bit when I realized and I looked at this, the level of engagement I had in that project early on, long ago, with building the thing, compared to the level of engagement I have in Hartford, where I am part of a larger team and my touch is light. You know, it, at one point, may be uh, disturbing. Uh, particularly when I take that progression into a trajectory and uh, look off in the future, and it's easy to see that I might end up working on huge projects and having no involvement whatsoever in those projects. And that was a little disturbing at first, and then I realized, what better retirement plan could I make? So <laughs> I do go back, and, and I remember the other thing was the consistency of these projects, you know, how much they all do deal with a line of water, and is it disturbing to me that there is that consistency and not more of a divergence, not that this, these are the only projects we do or the only way we do projects. But my conclusion there is a little bit similar, that you can look at a career as a project itself, and what we're doing through this career, and you're doing it with your projects too, as students, is building on every project we do in the past and chipping away at getting a little better at it. So that continuum, in fact, I think, is not unusual, and maybe it is a positive thing. So I stop there.
I do have two questions. One. With, with Turkowitz, you mentioned you know, that, that blowout, that exceptional circumstance. Did, is there something you actually changed or modified, or did you just go back to what you'd done before? No, we changed a few things, but more of it was the timing. Uh, you know, we, we, we did not rebuild it immediately. We got through the winter. But when we did, uh, we had not lined the step pools, the base of the step pools. Uh, we had put a membrane in there just to hold a little bit of water. But when we went back and rebuilt it, we rebuilt it with concrete in the base of those uh, step pools. But that was about the only change. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. We added another splitter, a thing I didn't go into. And that is where I talked about the conversion from the woodland garden to the stone runnel. We put in another very complicated physical device that, uh, that allowed us to tap off a controlled amount of water to run through that a new arrival court. And we actually did upsize the pipe in the lower reach so that that flood water would not pass through that gap and over there. Uh, over their arrival court. So two things, that was a more substantial one. So the second one on Gannett, or Gannett? Uh, Gannett. Gannett. Uh, so do they continue to recycle, recirculate the water? Yeah, so that water, as I said, disappointingly is, but not bad. I mean, it, it is driven by pumps, merciful pumps in that pond that lift that water up and runs it continuously. So there's a positive benefit there, and that water is recirculated. It's continually dropped through those step pools and that aquatic plantings and cleansed in the process. So it gives, provides additional turnover and uh, cleansing. But it's not filtered. It, it, or is it, 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 it is not, there's a, there's a physical filter that keeps large particles, but yeah. not, uh, not, not biologically or uh, other than a gross physical filter, not filtered as such. Okay, thanks. So I wanted to ask you a question. The, uh, the, the, you, 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 in the Dell, <laughs> the water does return at a certain storm level, goes back into the pipe yeah, that bypasses fact, that, I think, right? I think you, yeah, you mentioned what you'd done and what we had done and somebody else had done the same thing. I think they yeah. build in the overflow for that. So, yeah, major yeah. storms disappear into that. So th that's one of the great opportunities in this situation is you have that built-in flood relief. If you did not have that, there'd no, there's no way in the world we would be considering this cir circumstance in Hartford if we didn't have that flood protection, which led to that huge project in 1940. Uh, so it's a beautiful kind of moment uh, that you can... Uh, it can take advantage of what's been done in the past, but improved what was bypassed in doing, in doing it. Yeah, and I think in our circumstance, and Steve can probably answer this better than I can, I'm guessing we could have probably still had some ponding system for a higher level storm, but it was the Daylight Creek that had a kind of scale to it that wasn't possible if we were going to go up in scale. Yeah, that's right. There, um, the, it, and this is an important point to, to focus on, and the, the calibration, as, as Warren said, the calibration of what, how you want this water to perform and what your vision for it is. I'll talk about this this afternoon. Um, but that was part of it, the, the, the how much to send through the dell versus how much to send through the pipe that was below. Um, it, it complicated balance between what the water quality objectives were. You know, the beginning part of the storm is where the water quality concerns are, so we wanted to get that through the pond. Uh, and the challenge for the pond then is to clean it. But then to, as, as you suggest here, to divert the rest of it so that it doesn't cause harm by blowing through the pond. Uh, and actually that process of separating relieved the hydraulic problem that we had at the, at the system because it was flooding. So by eliminating the burden, splitting the flow, we're able to achieve the water quality and stormwater management objectives, but also unburden the culvert that was there so it no longer flooded the neighborhood. So it was a win-win. You know, the other nice thing I more. might mention that I didn't in Bushnell Park that also makes what we're talking about possible is it is the Park River that was running through the park originally and buried. We have just a serendipitous situation where there's a tributary that comes into that. Its main catchment in that thousand acres that I mentioned is Kenny Park, which is actually a highly vegetated uh, three, four hundred acres in the headwaters. And so the water that we can tap actually comes from a fairly clean source. So whereas we would be very concerned about picking up the quality of the Park River, we have the opportunity to pick up what's called Dully Creek, which has very high water quality, and put it in a position where we know there'll be contact with the public and, and it, it engages interaction. But it's possible because we 
have a source different from the main river running through the park.